So what are labor traps? Labor traps are the things that are in the maternity care system that basically they have an idea of how labor is supposed to go and they have you in this narrow box or the textbook definition of labor. These are basically, they undermine your confidence. They make you think that your body doesn't work. They make you think that you need to do something when really maybe you're just following your own unique process. Labor traps also lead to the dreaded failure to progress label or thinking that you're not dilating or you end up agreeing to an intervention like having your waters broken, having Pitocin, being told that labor is not going to go well for you and you need to have a C-section. All of the things that derail a completely physiological birth, these are what I would call the labor traps. Anything that happens during your labor where they're messing with your physiological process. And I've gone into depth with a lot of the previous traps, but these last four are really quick. What are the last four labor traps in the 10 labor traps that you want to avoid if you want a natural birth? Well, the first one that you need to understand is the intensity of contractions. Now, a lot of people, they get this wrong and they say that it, contractions basically have to hurt. We talked about this during the labor stages, but let's just go over this again. Intensity of contractions does not necessarily mean that your labor is not progressing. All it means is that maybe you don't feel things as intensely as if you had Pitocin. So oftentimes, if you're not screaming, then the medical system thinks that you're not in labor. So you might actually be close to giving birth to your baby, but because you're so calm, they think you can't possibly be in labor yet, so let's do a vaginal exam to check you. Now, the problem with vaginal exams is that First of all, they hurt. Second of all, they interrupt your process. Third of all, they can actually trick your cervix into thinking it's not safe. And then your cervix closes up. So by the time they're checking you when you've been stressed, you might have actually been dilated eight centimeters. And then you closed right back up again because your body's like, oh, wait a minute. Our environment has changed. We got to change something. So when you go to the hospital in labor, what you want to do is recognize that, hey, maybe you might be moving far along in your process. You might be ready to give birth, but that change in environment might shift things that you have to get back into your zone, your labor state, to be able to relax again and open up. So your cervix is not going to stay open. This is another reason why I hate vaginal exams. Because anytime someone's like, oh, I need to do a vaginal exam to find out if I'm dilated or not. I need to have my care provider check me before labor even starts. No, no, your cervix is going to open and it's going to close and it's going to open and it's going to close. And it can even close up and refuse to open up anymore, even when you get to six centimeters. You could be walking around at eight centimeters dilated and still not be in labor. Like this is one of the things that people just do not seem to understand. So it's a huge natural birth trap and it's a huge labor trap to even think about cervical dilation and about intensity. Because the truth is that there are women out there who have had orgasmic births. There are women out there that they didn't feel any intense contractions and yet a baby still came out. So when you're thinking, oh, my labor contractions aren't really strong enough for me to birth my baby. Mm -mm. No, because even in my own labor, there was a point where just before I hit transition, where I was like, this, it, this feels like labor's slowing down for me. It's not very intense. I could probably take a gravel and go to bed and I could probably sleep through these contractions. Like they're not that intense. And then just before my baby was born, I had the mother of all contractions and then my water's released and her head came out. So intensity, no, especially when you're hypnobirthing or when you're really in a relaxed state, you're not going to be able to go by how painful contraction is as to whether or not you're progressing or not. It just doesn't work. So the next one I already led into this is water's intact. So oftentimes people say, well, if your waters haven't released yet, you're not progressing. Bull. My waters do not release 
until just before my babies are crowning. And there are babies that are actually born inside the amniotic sac, and it's called an encol or call birth, where you can actually birth your baby, especially underwater, and they come out in the amniotic sac, or the amniotic sac bursts just as the head is coming out. So in the case of my son's birth, I was pushing and pushing and all of a sudden my water's released. And then that's when his head finally came out. And then with my daughter, it was very much the same, except that I wasn't doing the pushing. My body was doing the pushing for me. I had a lot of pressure and all of a sudden that pressure released when my water's released. And then I realized that there was her head. But there are some moms who are birthing their baby. They can see the head, but there's like a bulging bag of waters. And then the waters release. And as I said, there's also the option that your waters don't release at all and your baby is born in the call. And this was actually considered good luck a long time ago. Like it was a superstitious thing. Like if you had a mermaid birth, as they called it, that baby was like, it was a good luck uh, symbol. Now in the hospital, the doctors very much just think that breaking your waters is going to allow the baby's head to push on your cervix to open you up, which is not how birth works. But because they are still going by the same obstetric model that they followed from the 1800s, and the men back then were just assuming we were machines, and they didn't actually know anything about how our bodies worked, they just assumed they did by cutting up corpses. They just kept that same model going. So the idea of breaking your waters is because they think that the pressure of the baby's head on your cervix is going to open you up. In truth, if your waters have not released, it is because your baby is not ready for those waters to release. Your baby actually needs those waters to stay intact because if they have that nice squishy cushion of fluid, then the intensity of the contractions is not going to squeeze on them. It's going to squeeze on the balloon, which is full of the fluid, and it's able to move and shift, and baby's able to get it into a better position. The cord might also be in the wrong spot, which means that baby needs to have that cord moved, sometimes around the neck, and that's not an emergency, okay? There's actually an article that Rachel Reed has written inside Midwife Thinking, that talks about the nuchal cord, as they call it, and how it's the perfect scapegoat for all of these interventions. But the truth is that like babies can be born with the cord wrapped around their neck. I've actually seen this. In fact, Rebecca's birth with the uh, vaginal birth after two cesareans, the cord was around her son's neck. Now, the reason for this is actually quite a beautiful design, is that the cord around the neck allows it to not get compressed. So there's actually a reason for that. If the cord is slipping down on their head and they're being pushed out, that cord is being squeezed. And if it's squeezed, it can't get oxygen. Your baby is not breathing through their neck. So the cord around the neck is not strangling your baby. This is another thing that people don't seem to get is your baby is breathing through the blood in your cord. So after birth, this is also why you want optimal cord clamping not delayed cord clamping, because if your baby needs some more time to get that oxygen into their lungs, if they're not breathing right away at birth, the very last thing you want is for the doctor to snip the cord and take that baby to NICU. Because now they've taken that baby away from their oxygen source and their blood supply. So you actually want that blood supply from your placenta to keep getting to your baby. And unfortunately, when you clamp the cord or when the cord gets compressed, that doesn't happen. So that is the real reason why babies, sometimes they're not getting oxygen is if the cord is compressed or squeezed or pinched. And that is more likely to happen if they break your waters. So don't let them break your waters. Tell them no. Tell them to stay the hell out of there. Better yet, don't even let them give you a vaginal exam because some doctors and some nurses will intentionally break your waters and say, oops, well, I guess things are just going to move on faster now. No, do not let them do this. Do not let them break your waters. So the next one is the pushing length of time. 
Now, in a physiological birth, what normally happens is that your body will do the fetal ejection reflex when it is time. You will start to feel pushy during some of your contractions. You will start to get that urge and you will bear down and you will push at the height of that contraction and then ease through and that will help open your cervix, that will help bring your baby down. This is why I hate the medical system when they say, oh, don't push until we get the doctor here. Don't push until you're 10, meter, 10 centimeters dilated. Don't push unless we know that it's time for you to push. They have no idea when it is time for you to push. The only one who knows when it's time for you to push is you. When your body takes over, and it will in a physiological birth, remember we're talking physiological, we're not talking medicalized, we're not talking about they gave you oxytocin or pitocin or whatever they want to call it, they didn't break your waters, they haven't messed with your birth, you don't have an epidural, like you are having a physiological birth here in this sense. If you are having a medical birth, this is not going to necessarily be the case because now your body is being hijacked by another process and those hormone receptors are going to be interrupted. So this is only if you are having a physiological birth. If you have had the epidural, you're probably gonna be pushing longer and you're probably gonna need somebody to help you know when to push if you can't feel it. This is another reason why unmedicated birth reduces the amount of tearing that you have because again, you can feel everything. You can know what positions to get in. You're actually following the processes of your body. If you have Pitocin, what happens is that you're having all these intense contractions, but they may just be trying to smack your baby out when it's not actually following the physiological process. And then you're trying to push this baby out because it's so painful, but your cervix isn't actually able to bring up to the uterus for the fundus because again you've interrupted that so then your cervix swells and it's not going to open that is completely different from a physiological birth if you are pushing during a physiological birth you are working with your body and your body is saying it's time for us to push we need to push to bear down to bring this baby down this is what your body wants you to do and when you resist that you're resisting your body you're getting more pain and you're interrupting your physiological process and your body is going to take that as, hey, maybe it's not time for us to do this right now because there's a tiger in the area and it's not safe to birth. And then they shut that process down. And the medical system sees that as you're pushing too long, baby's not coming down, we need to do a C-section or we need to do a vacuum extraction. And now you are having a intervention in your birth. So it doesn't matter how long pushing takes. You could start pushing at eight centimeters and then suddenly like you end up having your baby in two hours. It also doesn't matter if like suddenly you don't have any urge to push and you've dilated, but it's just a rest and be thankful phase. Some, some women get this too. Is like you've dilated, you're resting and now it's like, okay, take a little bit of a nap. Rebecca was able to rest between her contractions and she'd actually get to take a nap while she, and then she'd start pushing and then she'd lay back down and she'd sleep a little bit and then she'd start pushing again and then she'd sleep. Mine, my baby was out in 10 minutes, my, my second. My first, it was three hours of pushing because they kept telling me to push when I did not have the urge. And I was just desperate to avoid being wheeled in for a C-section because I knew that I was on a time limit. So that's another thing about the right environment is you want to make sure that you aren't in an environment where they're going to be putting a clock on you. You want to be where they're going to support your physiological process. This is why also, if you're gonna choose a hospital birth, you probably want to have a doula who can stand at the door and keep everybody out of the room. And you want a partner who's able to also keep everybody out of the room. And you need to know enough about your own body that you can follow your own physiological process without wondering if something's going wrong because you're pushing for so long. That is such a labor trap. It's like a huge labor trap.
And oftentimes it leads to a cesarean when you're in the hospital. It doesn't if you're at home. Finally, the last one, if you have had one or more previous births, this is a huge labor trap for you as well. The idea that second or third time moms or anyone who's had more than one baby is that you're going to go faster. This is one of the labor traps that I almost fell into with my second birth with my daughter because I kept being told by the midwife over and over, you need to be going faster and progressing at a faster rate than you are. Instead of following my own unique physiological process, which is what I needed because my daughter needed to turn a certain way and I needed to be able to also not have that stress and my environment was actually very stressful now that I have gone back and thought about it. I had a very stressful partner. I had a doula that was very much hands-on that I didn't actually need. And I had a midwife that was very much hands-on and by the book as well. Now, nothing against my midwife or my doula because they were just doing what they had been taught to do and they were helping me as best they could with what they had for knowledge. But I was not trusting my own physiological process and I was still letting other people tell me what I should have done. So as a second or third time mom, if you've never given birth before vaginally or physiologically, if you were induced or you had multiple cesareans, the fact of the matter is that if that happened, if you had a cesarean and you didn't go into labor on your own at all, then, and you didn't actually experience labor, especially if you had a planned cesarean, then you're basically giving birth like a first-time mom. If you were induced before, you're basically giving birth like a first-time mom. And the other thing is, even if you did have a completely spontaneous vaginal birth, like I did, that does not necessarily mean that you're going to go fast. Because I ended up having weeks of prodromal labor, stop and start labor to warm up the process. And then I went into labor for 24 hours, which was very early labor. I got up to six centimeters and then things shut down. And then I had a 16 hour break where I was just, nothing was happening. And then labor progressed. And after five hours of a very mild labor where I was just like, I didn't even know I was in active labor. All I knew was I was vocalizing through contractions and it was just going to take as long as it took. As far as I was concerned, I wasn't calling the midwife back. I wasn't calling the doula back. I was just going to chill out in the pool. And it's like, either I have a baby tonight or I don't. Either way, I mean, we can always refill the pool. It's not a big deal if I, but hey, I've got the pool. So why not use it? Why not chill out in it? And in the end, as I was thinking, I think I'm going to get out of the pool and I'm going to go to bed. That's when I hit transition and that's when my daughter was born. And that part did go fast because my uterus took over. And then within 10 minutes of my waters releasing, baby was out. Like it just was like everything was just being pushed out. And that part did go fast. So maybe parts of your labor might go fast, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll go into labor earlier. It does not necessarily mean that you're going to have a shorter labor. It doesn't mean that you're going to progress one centimeter per hour. It doesn't mean that pushing is going to be shorter for you. And it doesn't mean that the placenta is going to come out faster. It doesn't mean any of that. Your baby is following their own unique process. Your body is following its own unique process every single time. So throw out that idea that just because you're having a second or third baby, that you're automatically going to go fast. Because maybe you do. Maybe you do go fast. But maybe you don't. And that's okay too. That doesn't mean that your body is broken. All right. So that is all I have for the labor traps. Thank you so much for watching. And if you want to know more about the labor traps or anything to do with natural birth traps, how to get the birth you want without having to fight, beg, or compromise, then you can check out my book, Your Empowered Birth. It's available at my website. You go to empoweringmomsbirth.com forward slash book, and that will get you your free copy of the Empower Your Empowered Birth, as well as 
the 20 traps you want to avoid when you're planning a natural birth. I'm also going to be including the labor traps at a later point. I just have to create that. And that will also be part of it. If you're in the Facebook group and you have just recently joined and you opted in to get the Empowered Mom Pack, then you've already got a copy of this book and already have a copy of the 20 traps. So all you need to do is find that email in your inbox if you did get it. If you didn't get it and you want to get on that list or you're like, hey, I didn't get my email, send me a message, let me know, and I will make sure that you get that. Because this is the book that helps, like basically it's the same system that I used to help Jenny to have her unassisted vaginal birth after cesarean in the hospital. She was 41 years old. She had gestational diabetes. She had preeclampsia with her first baby. She was much older. She's like 41 and she'd had a previous cesarean and an induction before that. She had chronic high blood pressure and she managed to have an unassisted vaginal birth after cesarean in a hospital where our health authority basically has the highest C-section rate in all of our province and all of our country. Like this is like, we don't do VBAC here. And the way we do VBAC is very VBAC tolerant. So she used the same process that's in your empowered birth to manage her fears and to be able to advocate for herself and able to get the care provider that was going to best support her and to navigate the medical system, which most moms don't know how to do. And she was able to avoid every single labor trap and every single natural birth trap to be able to do that. And Rebecca as well, she followed the same system and was able to have a vaginal birth after two cesareans at home unassisted with her partner catching the baby. This is also the same system I used when planning my empowered birth with my daughter. So I've been developing this for the last 10 years. And as I said, you can get that book. You can get the book, Your Empowered Birth, and it's at www.empoweringmomsbirth.com forward slash book. And that will get you a free copy of this book. The reason it's free is because I just want this information into your hands as fast as possible. Because the system is laid out with all of these traps and the mom groups, they keep perpetuating this. The medical system wants you to keep believing that your body doesn't work and that they are the saviors and they're the only ones that know how your body is supposed to work. And it's not true. And not only that, but a lot of the mainstream birth education that's out there is still perpetuating these same myths that are going to trap you and lead to more interventions, more pain, a cesarean, induction thinking your body doesn't work and just you're you're going to end up be, being traumatized. I'm just going to say it. You're going to end up being traumatized because of the way that birth has been taught within our medical system and our birth culture. So this book, Your Empowered Birth, will actually help you get out of that. You'll get past your fear. You'll be able to advocate for yourself. You'll be able to figure out exactly what your dream birth is and then you'll get it. Okay? That's my promise to you. Is you if you actually read this book and follow that system, you will get an empowered birth. You will get the birth you want without having to fight, without having to beg, without having to compromise, without crumbling under the pressure. You will have your dream birth. And the fact is that you only get to birth this baby once. And if you are only having a few kids, you only have a few chances. And why would you want to go through? two or more traumatic experiences and then just wait for the last one to be the one to get it right. As a first time mom, you can have that experience right out the gate. And your first birth actually informs a lot of your choices for your second and third, especially within our medical system and if you don't know all your options. So if you've ended up as a first time mom induced and had a cesarean, that automatically says something about you to the medical system that they're going to limit your choices and they're going to try to control your birth and they're going to discourage you from getting the birth that you actually want. And the same thing happened to Jenny, the same thing happened to Rebecca, the same thing happened to Lisa. And the fact is, is that even if something traumatic did happen, you can still get the birth you want the next time. 
So that's why I've broken it up into two chapters. One chapter is for first time moms. And the next chapter after that is for if you've already had one or more traumatic experiences. And this book will help you to get your dream birth, which is something that is unheard of in the medical system. They don't know how to do this for you. But once you understand the system and you know the questions to ask, you're going to be able to stay in your power and you're going to be able to be back in the driver's seat as the decision maker. And again, you can get that book for free at my website, www.empoweringmomsbirth.com forward slash book. Okay, so I hope you have a wonderful holiday season and happy solstice, happy Hanukkah, happy Kwanzaa and Merry Christmas and all of the other holidays. I, I can't list them all because I'll be here for a long time, but anything that you are observing or celebrating, I wish you a wonderful holiday season and I will see you in the new year. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.